Hello and welcome to this week's edition of The Road Less Traveled with Gary L. and Gigi's Boo. We're running late. We were actually <laughs> we're going over some of these stories. And I had the screen populated and the chat room was covered up and I missed the fact that it was time to go. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Hello, Grimnir. Hello, Moose Girl. Hello, Kate, Asmo, Betsy, Bitcoin Pop, Chalstony, Chloe, Graham C. I be Don C. Java Doctor, JJ, Wanataku, Paul Bunyan, Rain, Rob Works, Trust No One Behind the Woodshed, Colfax, Dakota, Dima, Flash, Nasty, Frumpy, Kozu, Poxified, Pond Sauce, Sock Puppet, Slim Jim Flim, and the Phantom, and hello, Gigi's Boo! Hiya. Sorry we're late, everybody. <laughs> well, you know, it's just, uh, well, there we go again. So, what you been up to this week, Gigi's Boo? Nothing too much. Just fiddle-faddling around, doing things that around the house, stuff like that. Taking care of Atticus. Just a little of that and a little of this. Sewing some. I've been doing some sewing. So that's that's about it. Well, I, Show enough. I just don't need no taking care of, does he? Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. You heard him a while ago singing. He sings. Yeah. He runs around in circles too, doesn't he? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. He, he can say, I'm not going to say it out loud, but y'all can read between the lines. You want to go... And when I say O U T S I D E, he'll spin around and around and run to the door and then spin around and around, open the door. Then he goes outside and he just does his business, as we say. <laughs> but today it was really crisp and cold. The sun was shining. It must have felt real good because uh, I went out to church and oh, he just jumped and spun and kicked and he was running and frolicking. So he's felt good today. And I'm glad he has. Because yeah. most of the time, Gary says he lays on his lazy ass and does nothing. <laughs> he does. Or bark at himself in the curio cabinet. That's a... <laughs> That. Beg for a biscuit. Oh, he's terrible. But don't let a snake show up. All oh, bad. God. We were laughing about. I don't think we've told them about that episode, the last episode with the snake. I don't remember. Um, no, no. I was in the bathtub. Gary was wor working. He wasn't here. And I looked down. We have a, a bathtub that has jets in it. Dear God, it was right before it got cold and the snakes were beginning to go in to hibernate. That snake slid out of one of those jets and I slid out of the bathtub like a seal and was screaming, hollered for Mama. She came and the way I screamed, Atticus knew it was something was wrong, and he, there he was. He reached over into the bathtub, grabbed the snake underwater, and was slinging it. Well, you know he's not doing too much damage slinging it underwater. So he realized that he wasn't fully in the tub, and he raised it, slung it, and threw it back down in the water. And the, by then, that poor snake was so drunk, it didn't know which way was up. But Mama began to, she pushed the stopper out. She got rid of the the snake really quick you know the water i would not the snake the water this atticus was still having the battle with the snake and finally he got the snake just right and popped it broke its neck and because it wouldn't stop wiggling he was still attacking it and i said dear god gary thought that was so funny he said i could see you sliding out of that bathtub like a seal i slid out atticus slid in but he got the snake he is a master snake killer, and I'm scared <laughs> to death of snakes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as long as, as long as there's a little electricity left in that snake, the Atticus is going to keep on slinging it. I'm going to sling it, that's right. <laughs> Poor snake, he didn't bother nobody. <laughs> no, it scared me to death, though. <laughs> wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's the story from this side of the of the Great Divide, I suppose. We got a few stories, as I said, oh yeah, our, our intro, I'm going to have to mention the fact that it's Kevin McCloyd at Incompetech.com, and that's his stuff, and this one's called The Sky of Our Ancestors, and that's our new music that we play in and out. Anyway, 
I'd like to uh, emphasize yet again what we talked about last week with the USDA hardiness zones. I did find the original article that talked about the changes, and it originated the change or the article originated in August of 2017, just last year, not that long ago. And yet again, it shows the diff the new maps, the new changes, and things that it's really important to emphasize because not many of us can afford to try to make a garden and nothing grow. Would you agree with that, Gigi Spoon? Oh, very much so. Yes. Yeah, that could be that could be very problematic, especially if you plan on uh, harvesting your seeds and saving them for another season. And they talk about uh, in this article the pros and cons of the changes. And firstly, they say it's good news because shifting temperatures in so-called marginal areas mean, mean you can expect success with a wider range of plants than before in parts of northwest Montana, which have been reclassified from Zone 5B to 6A. Longer summers and shorter winters have made it possible for farmers to grow artichokes and ginger. Okay, and it talks about, uh, also there's a link about how to grow ginger indoors. If you like ginger for your recipes, we also have a recipe coming up here in a minute. That includes some ginger. Some of the bad news, trees like sugar maples that depend on frigid wet winters to fend off pests and diseases have been perished, perishing in the southern reaches of their ranges. Now, there could be other reasons for that that aren't addressed here. And they talk about that. But, um, so, you know, if, I will go ahead and re -emphasize, or emphasize how they've changed this. The suggestion seems to be that, that they believe the weather's getting warmer. <laughs> I don't know. Something to look at. It could be... Uh, your your mileage may vary in, on that, actually, depending on where you are. A couple of um, recommendations I'd like to throw out to folks for those who want to refocus or uh, yet again, perhaps, to the uh, preparations sorts of things. Some of the folks that we enjoy and uh, read a lot of their articles. One is uh, the website... Doom and Bloom and Doom and Bloom dot net uh, with Amy and Joe Alton. Now Joe's a doctor and Amy's a nurse, so they talk about survival medicine. Obviously, pretty nice people actually. I've had personal contacts with them. They're nice folks. Highly recommended. So we'll go ahead and drop that into the chat. So anyone who has an interest can check out. Joe and Amy's site, and they have some, um, they do a show as well, and also they have videos and all kinds of good stuff. Another site that you might consider, a fellow by the name of Tim Ralston, and he has a blog, a blog page. He says he's a prepper, inventor, author, survivalist, entrepreneur, and an adventurer. So he talks about certain um, items like sanitation and campfire in a can, how to how to make a pre-prepared campfire. Hmm. Uh, picking a good shelter, sanitation, uh, survival training, uh, long-term food storage, and so forth and so on. Something that's worth checking out. So it's timralstonlive.com. And you can check that out. At your leisure. Oh, geez, we were talking about this. One of the things we were talking about pre-show and why we were late was this amazing recipe that I found. And since it's been cold weather here, at least, I found this recipe for curried cauliflower and kale soup. What do you, how do you like the sound of that, Gigi's boo? Sounds real good to me. Yeah, and uh, it's one of those 30-minute deals. <clears throat> they say 30 minutes. I've tried some of these uh, 
time estimations before, but I'm, I'm kind of picky when I cook, so it probably takes me about twice as long. <laughs> but it also, this article actually comes from savorylotus.com, which includes a lot of recipes like creamy sweet potato bacon chowder. Ooh. <laughs> and then a, another one called Ultimate Green Soup. They have a link for that. So we have this link, and this soup looks just marvelous. And we'll go ahead and pass that along. But some of the ingredients, of course, with curry and turmeric and cumin and black powder, or black pepper and black powder. Yeah, let's have something on that later, too. Cayenne pepper, butter ghee or coconut oil, and so forth and so on. That's so all the ingredients and the instructions are on this handy little card that you can actually print. As a, I guess all of these recipes have this feature that you can print the card out if you like the sound of the recipe. So we'll drop that in the chat room. Yeah. Okay, and did we say that we were on reallibertymedia.com, Gigi's boo? No, but say it. <laughs> I think I did. But I actually got it out this time at reallibertymedia.com and RLM Radio. And there's a chat room over here. If you're just wondering where all these links are going, they're going into the chat room. And later on, they'll go into the blogcaster and they'll be available for your perusal. But if you'd like to jump in and into the live side of this, you can jump over to the RLM chat room. And that's located on the homepage at reallibertymedia.com. Just come on over and say howdy. Here's a, here's a, you know, we keep talking about the things are going to be changing. Let me go ahead and jump over to this and we'll get a little bit out of order here. And there's a couple of write-ups and I think, I think they're worth reviewing for folks who, well, let's, let's back up a little further. Hal, Hal was talking about in his show today, three, 3 to 5 behind the woodshed, talking about how things have gradually changed. As they slip up on you, the boiling the frog, as some people call it. And his uh, recommendations that people examine their surroundings, find a place to plug in, and try to make a difference, understand what's going on, and, and pre prepare. I think that is the key. Rather than being reactive, prepare for what may come down the pipe. I think that's, good rec that's a good recommendation in a lot of areas. But first of all, I think we have to understand where we came from, where where he seemed to be being herded, or where we're going, or where a lot, some people want us to go, and the pros and the cons of both of those things. So, I have found a very good write-up uh, on a couple of things. One of them is, it answers the question, discusses tribalism. What exactly is tribalism? And that's the starting point for most of us, most of our ancestors at any rate is that's where it all began and there are pros and cons to tribalism and excuse me and then on the other side of the equation we have something called collectivism and which is the opposite of individualism so tribalism and collectivism kind of reside at opposite ends of the spectrum okay somewhere separate from those things is something called individualism but it's your no man is an island i think that was a very appropriate uh statement and i can't remember who actually wrote that who wrote that who wrote that gg's boo i have no idea <laughs> I can't remember where that quote comes I, I from. I really don't. I've heard it all my life, but I, I don't know who, who wrote it. Yeah, and we are social by nature, so it's very difficult for an individual, a single human being, to exist, and especially under adverse conditions. 
So the likelihood of making it through a uh, serious conflagration of some sort all by yourself is very low. Therefore, you have to associate yourselves, at least, with a small uh, group of people, of like-minded folks, Mm -hmm. hopefully people who each have a particular talent or something uh, they can interdependently bring to the table. What are your thoughts on that? Of course. We had uh, some people that wanted to uh, join up with uh, Gary and I and my immediate family and some close friends we had. And Well, we want to be with y'all. Well, yeah, a lot of people wants to be with us because we know what we're doing. Well, you know, bring something to the table with you. This was uh, a person that was very well to do in the community and was talking about, well, you know, I, I don't know. There's not much I can bring to the table. I said, you can chop wood, can't you? He said, well, to tell you the truth, I've never done it. And he said, you know, my wife is sick. Now, she's one of these gals who's had all this plastic surgery and wants to stay pitiful as one of my nieces, little nieces say, and she's not able to do anything. She's got some illnesses. And these are the words I said. I said, I don't care what's wrong with her. She can sit her ass on a five-gallon bucket and take a plunger and wash clothes, but she's going to do something. There's nobody in this crowd going to get a free ride. So anybody you bring into your tribe, you bring them in, and they have to add something to it. And if it's chopping wood, if it's washing clothes, because it's washing clothes, if you've got a crowd, it's that's going to be every day. You're going to have to wash something almost every day. So, I mean, you know, you don't want anybody that's going to sit down on you. Uh-uh. They, they can sit down by themselves and root hog or die. They're not going to come here and, and sit down and, and, and not add to it. And uh, you got people that are very good at cooking. Um, Sewing. You need somebody with some skills, though. Now, we're not counting. We're not counting elders who are disabled. You're going to take care of elders. You're going to take care of small children. But even children at a certain age can take on some responsibility. If it's not anything but gathering the, the wood to bring the fire to the fire. They do something, you know. But yeah, you do that. Yeah. And that's a great segue into what we have uh, on the board next. And when I was growing up, I don't, I don't know if we talked, did we talk about the potbelly stove last week? GD? I don't think so. Yeah, there was something that came up about, um, it was over on Farce, Farce Book, and there's a group over there called Appalachians. And by the way, hello, hello Moose Girl. So Moosey's here, Moosey's usually yeah. not here. I saw her and I said, it's so good to see it. Yeah, see her. I, saw, I noticed that when you were talking. It's the moose girl. The moose is on the loose. Hello there. Glad to see you. But anyway, yeah, how I'd be very cautious of neo-tribalism. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, we have to examine the history of things and the, the aspects of tri- yeah, neo-tribalism is just another collectivist trap, by the way. Anyway. Um, we were talking, there was a posting on the Appalachian, uh, site that asked, they always ask silly questions, but one of them, they had a picture, <laughs> they do, yeah, they have a picture of a, of a pot-bellied stove or a coal stove or some might recall. And it, uh, it posed the question, how many of you folks remember these? And so of course I pipe up, yeah, I remember it. We had, uh, several in our three-room schoolhouse, where I spent um, grades one through five, it would have been one through eight, had they had not had the wonderful idea of consolidating schools. The because, dumbing down of America. Uh, that's right. And that's right, yeah. Uh, this was a community school, but anyway, my comment went on to say that, yeah, I remember these. We'd sit around these stoves, at the three-room schoolhouse with the outhouse and the hand pump 
in conditions of two or more feet of snow, and which you could get to school because it was within walking distance. And we'd sit around the potbelly stove and, and stick our cork sole boots onto the stove and create this wonderful aroma, and we'd get yelled at. Of course, by the teacher. By the way, there were two teachers. The one teacher for grades one through five, and the other teacher who was the principal <laughs> in grades seven and eight. So in two different rooms. With a central room in case the weather was so terrible that we had to have recess in, in there. But anyway... This gives you kind of a setup for the way we used to live. And Gigi's book can remember some of this, I think, that it wasn't uncommon. You just go out and about on your own. You knew you were smart enough to know how thick the ice had to be before you walked down onto it. And you were smart enough to know how to tie a knot sufficiently uh, so you could put a rope in a tree and swing out over a creek without the rope breaking. Or I mean, kids, these are things that we took for granted, but I don't think exist that much anymore. What do you think about that, Judy's boo? No, I know they don't. You go out, people are afraid to turn their children loose. There's so much meanness in the world. Uh, just like you walked to school, we we walked, and we had a creek below our house. We found things to amuse us. We'd take fingernail polish and put it on the back of the crawdad, turn it loose and see how far it could get down the creek. And we used different colored polishes to try to see, and Sure, about six months to nine months later, maybe a whole year, we'd find that one of those crawdads had made it all the way down the creek. So we did things to amuse us. And and that's you don't see that anymore. Now you see his kids with cell phones in front of them and all that. They're not taught to use their imagination um, to do to do things that are fun anymore. They don't. They don't do it. I think parents make money or either go in debt so they can have it. And I don't know. It's just they've missed out on so much in my book. Yeah, you brought up an interesting point. And I'm not sure yet what I think about it. But I'm not convinced that this whole perception of danger is all that accurate. I don't know whether it's just uh, because we've been subject to so much fear porn. Yeah, things bad bad things happen. Bad things have always happened. But is is it a product of control? Is it a product of fear porn? Is it a product of we must rely on the system for our safety? But whatever the case is, I can I recommend some thought about that. Perhaps if you find yourself feeling paranoid all the time, that's not good. You're supposed to live in a condition <laughs> where you're supposed to have some degree of happiness. But if you're paranoid all the time, you certainly can't be that way. Mm -mm. Um, but it's kind of a long lead-in to this article that came out of Reason magazine. That it, it kind of stunned me. The whole The whole lead line kind of stunned me. It says Utah may legalize free-range parenting. Let that sink mm. in. Let that sink in for a moment. On January 8th, uh, Lenore Skenazi wrote this article and says that lawmakers want to roll back penal penalties for childhood freedom. What kind of penalties? What kind of well, penalties? Well, yeah, are let's get let's let's get to that. The Utah State Legislature is reviewing a bill that would decriminalize the action of responsible parents who let their kids walk or play outside. If the lawmakers pass SB sixty-five, 
parents who want to give their kids a smidgen of childhood freedom won't have to worry about a knock on the door from cops or child protective services second-guessing the decision to send their kids outside without a security detail. And it says, Utah is actually ahead of the curve when it comes to giving kids and parents their independence. As there was a previous amendment passed to the Every Child Succeeds Act two years ago, that parents shall not be exposed to civil or criminal charges for allowing their child to responsibly and safely travel to and from school by the means the parent believes is appropriate. Now, can you believe all, can you believe this though? I I guess from, from my perspective, I sit here and I'm stunned that this is even a conversation. So some of the stories that disturb the uh, sponsors of the bill include the cases of parents such as South Carolina, hello, Deborah uh-huh. Harrell, Deborah Harrell, whose nine-year-old daughter was taken away for 17 days after she let her play in a popular park without parental supervision. And in Connecticut, a young uh, a, a woman was handcuffed and arrested after she overslept and her eight-year-old walked to school alone. And in Texas, a lady whose children were interviewed by caseworkers after she let her six-year-old play 150 feet away from the house. And well, what got... does it sound like? Think about it a minute. Go ahead. Well, it goes back to uh, you're not in a prison, per se, but you are in a prison. Yeah. Hal talked about <laughs> that, and he talks about that. It's an open-air prison in which exactly. we, which we I'm reside. reminded of the movie called New York. You remember that one with... Um, uh, who's the guy that lives with the Goldie Hawn? Oh, okay. Not yeah. Russell. Yeah, yeah. New York. Mm-hmm. Okay. New York was a, was a prison. Yeah. So much truth in fiction. There are so many cases like this, but the reason, the reason I bring this out is because this is, this relates back to the, the distinctions between tribalism and collectivism. You know, the whole concept of it takes a village to raise a child. (laughs) On a local basis, there may be some validity to that. But when you start talking about uh, the whole collectivist mindset of the the entire world, becoming one global village, you've heard these phrases before, I'm sure, but this is the result of this global village concept. It's a very disturbing article on a, on a lot of levels. Yeah, that's well, that's another, <laughs> Goober, that's another issue. Where Why would they want to put them in public school anyway? In a future situation, I guess this all goes back to the concept, are we psychologically prepared to rapidly shift from basically a, a condition of dependency, and it's what, it's what we've been conditioned into, suddenly into a situation where we have to take care of ourselves. What, what are some thoughts you, that you might have on that, Gigi? Well, I think I, I grew up being taught how to take care of myself. And I think we all were, and I think my nieces were, and I think everybody teaches their children basically what to do. But like you said, sometimes it's taken a little bit too far, you know, with the, watch, I could tell a funny story about my niece, but I'll I'll wait till Gary gets through and I'll tell you. But it really, I don't know. I think people are taking things too far 
to a certain extent and really not paying attention to what they really need to be taking serious. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I think I think a lot of this is a result of the very medium that we're using right now, the social media. I think a lot of it is related to that. Yeah. I'll tell the story about my name. You know, she's always been the, the Southern Vale. She doesn't particularly like going to her dad's because she doesn't like her stepmother. And the stepmother's not mean, not mean to her. They just have a different set of rules that they go by. And so my sister bought her one of these watches that has a tracker on it. She keep up with her at all times. It's kind of like a GPS and also, she can call her. She's got numbers programmed into this phone. And it's like we used to see on sci-fi. They can push a button on the phone. The face will come up. You can FaceTime with them. She didn't want to do her spelling homework when she was at her dad. She did her math. And she said, nope, I'll wait. Mama can help me with my spelling homework. Her stepmother said, nope, now we're going to do it right now. She just raised her arm up. And she said, all right. Get ready. I'm getting ready to push the button. Well, they didn't know that she didn't have 911 programmed in, which she does. But she wasn't going to do that. She was just going to probably call her mother. But they later told her daddy, told my sister, yeah, she had us up against the wall. We really thought that we were getting 911 called on us. And I said, oh, my God, when I found out about it, I couldn't help but laugh. And I said, what was you going to do? She said, keep them in line. You got to keep them in line, Brent. Keep them in line. I like to fell over because you've got to remember this is a child who was kind of scarified with everything. Her brother is a Marine, and he told her a couple of moves. And I was telling Gary about that. And some kids picked on her. Not that she was smaller. She's average size, little girl, real sweet, real pretty. But she was getting picked on because she was humble. She was kind. And she came in and told us, she said, I used that move that my brother showed me that the Marines used. I said, Uncle Gary, I know what it is. I said, I wrenched that old girl and I put her into the fence. I said, oh, God, what did they do to you? She said, they didn't do anything to me, but take five minutes of my recess. So I think, you know, not bragging, you teach each generation to take care of theirself. We're not saying that nothing can't happen to them. We're not going to turn them loose and never know where they go, never know what they do. But you, you teach them to take care of theirself and teach them in the right way. And I told her, I said, don't be threatening anybody with that watch. She said, keep them in line, Brian, keep them in line. I know that was kind of long, but it was That's funny. Okay. Gary and I laughed That's about right. that. We thought that was really funny. Yeah, she goosenecked her. Yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a very effective thing, by the way. It's pretty simple. And get someone to show you that. And speaking of showing you things, what about these survival tips, Gigi's boo? Now, some of them we talked about before. We needed to touch a little bit on first aid kits. We talked about. Mm -hmm. Medication, I wanted to tell you, we, we went to a, a demonstration oh, sometime back, and there was a doctor in the group, and he really, I thought he was just really smart because he did lots of things with simple things. And, you know, we talk about suturing and stopping blood, and I told you about the set and spider webs with stop blood. It really will. But he said if you didn't have a suture kit, be sure that you have as many large safety pins as you can put into that kit because you can take that large safety pin, you can pinch that wound together, and you can weave that safety pin in and out. Now, he had a, a dummy arm and did it, and I, it was a couple of people bit the dust when they saw it because he made it look real with the uh, red fluid coming out of something. <laughs> and and, it, and it, I was amazed. I watched him, and so... I can suture with a safety pin. I I would have thought maybe two or three, but he used one or two, and, man, he had that thing tight. Now, it wasn't going to be a pretty suture when it was done, but it was a life-saving. Another thing I want to talk about is if you have a deep enough wound and you're in a survival mode, I would suggest that everybody add a portable, battery-operated, sterile cauterizing pin 
it's really a high temp and it runs on batteries and you just switch it on. And if you've got a bleeder, all you have to do is hit it, hit that bleeder with that tip and it'll, it'll burn it and seal it. That's one of the other things that you would want to have in there too. A lot of people go and buy all these suture kits. That's great. If you can't get the suture kit with the actual suture, the needle, suture needle, you can buy needles in Walmart or any of your novelty stores that have a crook on it that they use for upholstery sometimes. If you can get those in plain old white, get white cotton thread, tie a knot in it and go to suturing. That will hold it. You just clean it with alcohol and keep some antibiotic ointment on it. And in about four or five days, you can take those, clip those sutures and take them right out. In a first aid kit, you need to have your surgical tape, all sorts of sizes of band-aids, gauze, you know, the four by four gauze or squares. You would need some wrapping. We call it clean in the nursing community. It's just plain a rolled gauze that you can wrap around it. And a septic like alcohol. If you can't, if you haven't got any alcohol, pour liquor on it. If you've got any liquor with you. Anything to kind of sterilize it. You need cotton balls or Q-tips. Have some disposable gloves. And also, if you can think about it, do some plastic bags. Because if you're out in the wilderness and there's blood shed, wild animals are going to smell the blood. And they're going to come to wherever it is. And you need to be aware of that. You need eye drops, Plano Visine or uh, Clear Eyes, whatever, have that to wash it out. Get you a bottle of a normal saline. You can buy that at most drug stores. You might have to get them to order it for you, but they can. You can wash anything out with it. You need insect repellent. Be sure you pack Tylenol, Motrin, aspirin. Have uh, tweezers, scissors. Your safety pins, like I said, thermometer. All kind of ointments. Be sure you do take calamine lotion. Be sure you do pack some type of antihistamine. And like I said, your vitamins and things of that sort. You can go on Amazon and order suture kits. But like I said, if you're in a pinch, plain old rounded needle. And if you haven't got a rounded needle, you can use a plain old sewing needle. That'll work just as good. Just wind it in and out and pull it together. Another thing that you really need to do, if you've got somebody in your group that knows how to start an IV, Gary and I were talking about this. Most anybody that's been a medic in the armed forces, they know how to start IVs. And if you want to learn to start an IV, I would get in touch with somebody who could show you. Anybody can stick it. You just need to really be aware that you're putting a foreign object into the body and the skin is the largest organ, and it is the first barrier against infection. So you need to keep that clean. What else, Gary? I'm looking right now because one of the things that you might run into, and I think the whole thing about the IV is really important. So I think it's good practice for everyone to know how to start an IV. Mm -hmm. But you also have to find the IV materials. And where would you find, where would you find that? I'm not so sure you couldn't get IV fluids off of Amazon, but I know you can get it at your cattle food place. You might have to ask for it, but they have it. They have the line. They're going to have a bigger needle than what you are going to need. And always pays to have somebody, if you can bring them into your group, that's a medical person because they'll know exactly what to do. And they can teach you. It's not hard to learn. It's really not. It's just getting it in there and making sure you don't have any air going in and that type of thing from the line, the IV line. And you need to calculate it. You don't want to run the fluids in too quick unless somebody's got shock. Unless they're shocked, profusely beating, you want to bring it in pretty fast. Because you can't overload the system and put them in congestive heart failure. Right. Uh, yeah, Graham said don't forget your peroxide and rub it alcohol. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, you need that, and you need, Gary hates that sanitizer, that hand sanitizer. Right. But, but stock up on that because that would work really well to start an IV. You could drop that on there and wipe it with a cotton ball, and you'd be pretty well okay to start that IV right. and, and get it started. That's, that's something good for that. Yeah. 
you know, one other thing too, and kind of kind of related actually, is a tourniquet. I think it's very important to have tourniquets among your medical gear. In fact, each person should be carrying one. Should be, mm-hmm. and you can buy these tourniquets there. They're like, here's one I'm looking at right now for thirty-two dollars doesn't have a, a great review but i mean you get the idea unfortunately i guess and, and unfortunately our militaristic adventures has wound up providing us with a access to a great deal of emergency medical equipment one of the things that you were talking about spider web cayenne pepper is a very good material to stop bleeding Mm-hmm. Uh, one other thing, mm-hmm. you know, they've got the liquid stitches out that you can buy. That is nothing more than super glue. Yeah. That's all it is. If you can't get the liquid stitches, just go buy super glue. Got a cut and it's not bleeding profusely, just hold it together. Set that super glue on top, it'll stop it right then. Right. But these soft tactical tourniquets, they're, they're very small, they're very lightweight, they're easy to use. Bear in mind that. Once once you apply a tourniquet, only an experienced and knowledgeable person should remove it. Isn't that true, Judy's Boo? That's true. That's true. If it's a tourniquet that's used like for great blood loss, right? something like that, you really got... I keep thinking about the femoral artery. A lot of people catch it in the back of the leg, mm-hmm. you know, at that artery. Mm-hmm. And that's where we had a guy come in and the paramedics in the field... They had hemostats hanging off him, looked like an Egyptian necklace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they got it stopped, and then the doctors went in straight into surgery and uh, got it fixed and got it put back together. Right. But you, and you, don't be surprised that you might not have to do some type of surgery out in a disaster area. Right. Uh, that's where it pays to have plenty of liquor and a doctor with you, if you get a doctor with you, because they'll know really what to do. Mm-hmm. So you don't have a lot of time. If you get, if you happen to be in a situation where there's arterial bleeding, how long does it take a person to bleed out, Gigi's boo? Man, if it's arterial, it's not going to be but about three minutes at the most. Right. So you don't have a lot of time. And in a, I guess you have to say, ship hits the sand scenario, mm-hmm. <laughs> you're very likely going to run into uh, casualties of this nature. And also head wounds. Head wounds is something that's a a significant challenge uh, in in a tactical situation. What's what's your advice as a nurse dealing with head wounds? Level of consciousness first. Make sure the airway, always make sure the airway is open. Level of conscious first. Then uh, you assess the wound and ice. And if it needs a suture, you suture it. You keep them awake. You heard your mama say all her life, keep them awake for four hours. Don't let them sleep. And go from there. If it's if it's a severe head wound and you do all you can, there might be there might be nothing else you can do. And that way, if it's really bad, you might as well get ready to see some seizure activity. So I always roll them to the left side. And it might be you might lose somebody. You know, you you never know. Because if you're out in the field, there's not too much you can do about a head wound. It's right. it's pretty much closed and right. over with. It's, it's, yeah, and if you're going to use a compression bandage, do not put the knot area over the head wound. Unlike if you have a limb injury and you tie it with a compression bandage, you tie you'll and, you'll, you'll tie and you it. Make sure how big the that if the wound is bleeding. I didn't mean to cut you off, honey. If if you put a dressing on and you want to make sure. You know, you get some bleeding come through. Take a pen and mark it. Mark around it where it's bled. Then in a little bit, look again and it's bled over that mark. You know, you've not stopped the bleeding. That's a good way to check to see about the bleeding. And a normal, like a limb wound, you tie the uh, compression bandage over top of the wound area. And that, Mm -hmm. that increases the compression. You do not do that on a head injury. And the reason you don't is because you could possibly force a piece of skull, fractured skull, you could force a piece of skull into the brain. So you really don't want to do that. You don't want to look, another, put a lot of compression on a head wound. Go ahead. Another thing is it wouldn't hurt to have dental tools with you. You know, you might get 
where you might not have you might not have a very good teeth and you have to leave you hadn't met teeth in other words you've not been to the dentist and if something's really rotted and pain there's nothing worse than a toothache that's that's a terrible pain get you some dental tools give them good swigs of liquor i'm a firm believer in that liquor drinking when it comes to pain you yank that sucker out pull it out <laughs> pull those toothies that's is probably not much worse than a bad tooth. Mm. Mm, that's true. And if you're in a uh, system down situation, there's not much else you can do. Grin or not, <laughs> and bear it. <laughs> but anyway, what else you'd like to touch on in that way, GD's boo? I'm sure there's that's some... that's that's about it with me. I've I've looked at uh, you know tried to think about. First aid, and we could talk a little bit about if you've got pets, you need to prep for them, and you need to know about even keeping your pets hydrated. It's very important. We talked about my granddad when we were talking about him having to move them, we build a sled for them. I made the remark, I said, before I let anybody hurt you or torture you, I'll kill you myself. And he said, Brenna, you don't have to do that. Give me a gun. Let me lay on this thing. He said, I can shoot like hell yet. So remember your elders and and think about them and think about the warmth. And remember your feet, too. That's another thing we yeah, need to touch I'm glad on. You, I'm glad you brought that up. Go ahead. Uh, feet are very important. Be sure if you're going to the survival thing that you've got good, sturdy shoes to walk in. Wouldn't hurt to have a couple of pair if it's cold weather or hot weather, wear you wool socks. Believe it or not, wool will protect you. And be sure you carry enough with you to take care of a blister, calluses, things of that sort, and keep your feet clean. Keep them clean and keep them dry, and you won't have any athlete's feet. Athlete's foot comes from people who have wet feet, just don't change their socks or keep their shoes clean or whatever. Doesn't hurt to wash them if you've got tennis shoes. I always keep all my old shoes and I have those stacked up in case, you know, you need to change. But you have some good things to take care of your feet. Keep your feet in good condition. Yeah. Keep I'm them glad moisturized. You, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because in a system down scenario, you're going to have to have at least two good pairs of boots or shoes that are suitable for outdoors. And make sure that you change them every day. You switch mm -hmm. them out each day. Also, uh, wool socks, you hit it. Uh, wool is the go-to item because mm -hmm. wool will keep you warm even when it's wet. It's the only material that will do that. Yeah, so if your foot, if your feet get soaked, your wool socks will help keep your feet warm. But your attention to blisters, that's critically important. Because a blister will get infected and you are, you're done for, basically. Mm -hmm. as, as far as mobility is concerned, you're, you're done for. So pay particular attention to your feet. Your feet, your feet are what gets you where you're going <laughs> in most circumstances. So that's a very important thing. Thank you for sharing that, Gigi's Boo. What else can you think of that might? I think that's about it with me. Uh, we touched on antibiotics last week. We touched on different things. We talked a little bit before we started the show, just on grabbing things out of our memory. People will tell you to carry matches. And a great way to carry matches is to put them down in a pill bottle. And instead of putting the box, the whole box, just take the part off that you strike it and put it down there with it and put the cap on and it's going to stay dry. Pill bottle usually keeps even your medicines dry if you drop them in the creek. It's that seal that tight. If you don't want to take do that, you can put them down in a mason jar and you can seal that up. You can also seal your matches by dipping them down in paraffin and let them dry and you can knock the paraffin off when you get ready to strike them that's about it and carry always carry if you're striking out with a bug out bag to begin with you're going to take all your stuff with you your other stuff but i have some kindling and the bug out bag that you can start a fire with some fire starters and some stuff of that sort 
you know, be prepared for at least three. If everybody has three little packs of kindling in each one of their bug outs, that's say me, Gary, and mom, my mom and dad, that's uh, that's 12 fires right there that we got covered with kindling. You know, we can find wood. We just need to have some dry kindling to get it started. So, Yeah, and a good fire steel is a good thing to have. Uh, mm-hmm. Fr- Frumpy in the chat room brought up a very important, actually a good segue point here is um, basically sheltering in place, and practicing staying in one place rather than... Wow, we do. Yeah, and I think it, and it's all situationally dependent. You have to be, to be prepared to do either thing. Bugging out, if you will, or moving to a different, more secure location is one option depending on the scenario. Mm-hmm. And you might end up in a situation where you want to shelter in place. You want to basically fortify your location, the place at which you're most familiar. That's always an advantage. And there's an organization, as we start to head toward the end here, the closeout, there is an organization that has been around for quite a while, and I've been affiliated with it, and it's called Americans Networking to Survive, and it's abbreviated A-N-T-S, or ANTS. They've been around for a little bit. They're fairly sophisticated, actually, in how you don't have to reveal your location to become affiliated with this. You can have a second location. That The bottom line is that they have facilities, they have materials available through the members that if you find yourself in a really, really bad situation and you do have the ability to communicate, you can contact this group, and they will send out basically what amounts to a care package to a location that you designate. So I highly recommend looking at these folks. Their mission is to provide members with basic supplies during disasters, and their goal is to have at least one member in every city and town. So they That's all, a good organization. Yeah. And that's, uh, they have videos, how-to videos. They have uh, the different functions or jobs that they have people they call camp ants who manage base camp activities. And they go out and find distressed members and deliver supply pods and talks about what's in a supply pod. And they actually have a Google map that you can place a location, your location, whatever you, whatever you decide or the drop point would be for you, you place that on that map. They have communication ants, which are responsible for shortwave and cell and internet communication, and they can place messages at drop points. You have a trail ant who goes out and finds distressed ants who need help if the camp ant is unable to do so. And you have donor ants who provide and transfer supply pods in a relay with other donor ants to a camp ant. So anyway, that sounds a little bizarre at first at first read, but once you look at it, they have their own disaster plan, color codes, guidelines. It's fairly well developed, and it's not one you hear very often. I'd recommend for those who have any level of interest in this, take a look at this. Okay. Gigi's boo, what else are you related That's about to this? it for me. Yeah, and I had here, and we'll talk about this next time, uh, about how to make a non-toxic, long-lasting, organic deodorant. So you can make your own deodorant, because nobody wants to be stinky, do they? I thought you were going to say something else for a minute, honestly. <laughs> I am sorry. I don't even want to know. My head, my mind is in the gutter. I'm sorry, y'all. I tell you what, boo boo bear. There goes Hiller again, I tell you. (laughs) Okay, and how to make gunpowder. And this will be on an upcoming edition. Gives you all the ingredients and the process of making your own gunpowder. And if you're interested at all in muzzle loading, that might be something to look at. And how to make homemade gun solvent. So all these things, they come in handy. They sound very simplistic, but in a ship-hits-the-sand scenario, those are the things that you'll probably need most of all. But we'll talk about that on upcoming Road Less Traveled. So Gigi's Boo, 
I guess it's time for us to say night, night. Go ahead. It is. I just want to tell you to remember to take the road less traveled. And I love you all big to my heart. Yeah, Boo Boo Bear. And we thank you guys for showing up with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you again next week on The Road Less Traveled. Bye-bye. <laughs>